debate, the Honourable Member for Fredericton. Fredericton. Uh, it is my pleasure to stand today in the House and address not only my fellow members, uh, Madam Speaker, but to know that many Canadians across this country are tuning in uh, to hear what their representatives on this floor have to say on their behalf. I want to recognize that today is the International Day of Remembrance for the Holocaust. We are also on the cusp of Black History Month beginning this weekend. In 2020, it is crucial to recognize the lessons history has taught us, the progress we have made on human rights, and all the work that remains to be done. I also want to recognize the victims and the families of Flight 752. Madam Speaker, I know many of us have had the privilege of spending almost two months in our home communities, connecting with constituents. Au cœur des dernières semaines, j'ai eu le plaisir de rencontrer des centaines de citoyennes et de citoyennes lors des rencontres d'événements publics et de ma première tournée de la rassemblement communautaire. I tell you, the people of Fredericton, Oromocto, Marysville, Majorville, and surrounding communities are engaged. I am so proud to represent such a dynamic riding, la capitale de la Sile province, officiellement bilingue du pays, where Indigenous leadership in the arts is putting New Brunswick on the map. We are also a riding where consistent devastating floods are making climate change real to people and where parents are standing up to demand more support for their children struggling with mental illness. And I am also proud to stand with and beside them as their MP. I want to address the speech from the throne. I was, in all honesty, very pleased to see where our priorities have landed. Addressing climate change, healing regional divides, acknowledging the need to further advance forward relationships with Indigenous peoples. I was ready to support the speech, I thought if there was ever a speech from the throne to support, this would be it. But then I was reminded of the last four years. I was reminded of the reason I decided to run in the past election and the promises I made to my constituents to hold government accountable, to challenge pretty words and superficial statements. As a wife and a mother to two Indigenous sons, I must stand in this house to protect their future to protect their inherent collective rights and be firm in my affirmation that their rights are non-negotiable. I want to speak for a moment on the proposed legislative and policy framework, the Prime Minister's two-track approach to a pan-Indigenous policy. It is being called the two-track termination plan by many Indigenous scholars and traditional leaders. It is reminiscent of the white paper on Indian policy from 1969. People have real, valid issues with what's being proposed. Indigenous people, those directly impacted by this legislation. We owe it to them to listen. The Government of Canada has been consistent in its top-down approach. The patriarchal relationship remains. Canada like a father to its children. Indigenous communities are not Canada's children. Their roots run the deepest on this land and they have the right to self-determination. We have convoluted, confused and complicated our end of the bargain, and that has gotten us where we are today. A deadlock over the land. The land we agreed to share. Canada's definition of sharing is not something I would feel comfortable teaching my children. Reconciliation means giving back where we took too much. It's achieving an equilibrium. I have heard critics say, we're all Canadian, we should all be treated equally, no special treatment. That only works if we are, in fact, equal. I'm not going to rattle off the statistics to describe the disparity that exists. We know what they are. What they mean is that we have to do better. We need real action, real negotiations that find parity in the voices represented. Madame de Président, au Canada, le droit de la consultation implique un consentement préalable, libre et éclairé. Ça signifie que l'enjeu doit être ramené à l'échelle individuelle et l'enchantillon des personnes qui sont consultées doivent adéquatement refléter la voix des peuples autochtones. Il ne s'agit certainement pas de prioriser la voix des organismes ou des entreprises qui détiennent le plus de pouvoir et d'influence au sommet. 
When Canada continues to ignore the voices of grassroots community members, traditional and hereditary chiefs, you have outrage and activism in the streets. The delays on certain energy product, projects like coastal gas link or fracking in New Brunswick are not to be blamed on the demonstrators. It was the willful ignorance of the players involved from the beginning who made Indigenous voices an afterthought. And so to see that Indigenous considerations have been prioritized is very encouraging. But forgive me if I remain suspicious. I was pleased to hear the mandate for UNDRIP in the throne speech. J'avais espoir que ces mots signifiaient qu'un réel changement était imminent. But in the past few weeks, we see the way this government has behaved in the unceded territory of the Wet'suwet'en peoples. It bears a striking resemblance to the behavior of a previous government in my backyard in 2014, when traditional elders of the Mi'kmaq Nation at Elsibuktuk built a camp to protect the land and water from the encroachment of a fracking company. At that time, it was only Elizabeth May on behalf of the Green Party of Canada and David Kuhn on behalf of the Green Party of New Brunswick who stood with the Mi'kmaq hereditary and traditional chiefs. Les pratiques coloniales déplorables de la GRC qui ont mené au dimensionnement d'une manifestation pacifique qu'ont fait les manchettes à l'échelle nationale. I have a personal connection to this history. As I had to see a family member, a traditional chief, handcuffed with zip ties and arrested as he was conducting a pipe ceremony. A lot has changed since 2014. We have come through the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's report of findings. Canada has reversed its opposition to the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Persons and has been working on legislation to see it enshrined in Canadian law. The inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls has published its final report, including the testimony of 2,380 survivors and family members of those lost. Je suis fier d'être membre d'une partie qui comprend ce qui ça signifie réellement à qui ne renonce pas à ses engagements envers la nécessité de travailler sans relâche à la réconciliation partout au pays. Unfortunately, Canada seems queued up to repeat the same mistakes it has been making for generations, the same mistakes it made in 2014. So despite my support for some of the words in the speech from the throne, I have little confidence in this government to understand its responsibilities or to implement the changes we need. Je crois fermement qu'en lorsque nous établirons une véritable relation de nation à nation avec les peuples autochtones, notre relation avec la terre-mère se portera beaucoup mieux. Our relationship with Indigenous peoples is the step forward for climate action. Earlier today, my fellow Green members both spoke about the urgency of climate change, and indeed, ridings across New Brunswick have been hit each of these last two years by historic flooding. The river systems at home are jammed. The snow is piling up in our forests. Our wetlands and buffer zones are compromised. We are seeing an increase in precipitation. All signs point to another bad flood season this spring. Madam Speaker, action is required. Our Prime Minister and his government know that. I want them to know I am committed to working with them to make progress on adapting to climate change and that I am committed to helping facilitate the rapid transition that our economy must also undertake. I want to talk for a minute about that. I am so excited by the opportunities that lay before us in the new economy. We know we have to end our dependency on fossil fuels, and I'm convinced we can do it while looking out for workers who will need new careers. We have always been and will continue to be a resource-driven economy. And just look at the bounty of the resources we have to offer towards renewable energy. Our long, sunny summer days, powerful river systems across the country, beautiful forests, and right at home in New Brunswick, the highest tides in the world. This new economy brings with it the promise of new jobs for electricians, mechanics, manufacturers, truck operators, and the list goes on. In New Brunswick, renewable energy companies are already accomplishing amazing things, showing leadership, sharing expertise, and building capacity. One solar company in Fredericton has already trained 200 people in the solar panel installation work, half of which have come from the Alberta oil sands. Il s'agit d'une opportunité qui permettra de réunir les familles néo brunswickois et du même coup de permettre aux travailleurs et travailleuses de prendre part à l'économie du futur. The people of my riding are ready and willing to be part of the new economy and they are eager to reduce their own carbon pollution. 
It is up to this government to give them the way forward. What is the plan to expend, expand public transit and increase electric vehicle uptake? Where is the plan to take, help everyday Canadians make their homes more efficient? To save I'm sorry, it's up. <laughs> questions and commentaires, questions and comments? <laughs> the Honourable Member for Fort, no, Sherwood, Sherwood Fort Saskatchewan. Thank you, uh, okay. Madam Speaker, and uh, it's a pleasure to congratulate you on taking on the role of, uh, of chair occupant, as well as to extend my best wishes to the uh, new member. Uh, I, I suspect we may agree on some things, disagree on, on some others, uh, coming from a riding that is very dependent on the energy sector. I would make the case that for my province, as well as for her province, uh, the Canadian energy economy is very important. Uh, for the foreseeable future, the world is going to be using hydrocarbons, and right now, uh, people in New Brunswick uh, have jobs that involve the importation of foreign oil uh, at world prices. And it seems to me logical that as long as there is refining happening in her province. Wouldn't it be better if we could connect the country from coast to coast with pipelines so that Western Canadian oil could be feeding jobs and opportunity in New Brunswick and in other parts of Eastern Canada? Given the reality that the energy sector exists and that right now uh, we're importing foreign oil into Eastern Canada, why not seize this opportunity for more Canada, more Canadian innovation, uh, as, we, as we continue to grow and develop and try and improve our environmental performance. Thank you. Honourable député de Fredericton. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank the member for your question. Um, you know, we've been criticized to say that you know, we can't turn the taps off now, uh, you know, there has to be that transition, and we're, we, we understand that. We're not turning the taps off. We know we need to get some of what we have in the ground to market. I don't think that building the pipeline is the way to do that. We have existing infrastructure that can continue to fuel our, our current energy demands. As we ramp up renewables, we can decrease that dependency. I don't see the need for that pipeline. And I also don't agree with the fact that um, connecting those resources would necessarily mean we're off of our foreign um, oil resources. That will continue. Um, so I think it's more about I want to see the concrete steps towards this, this, this future, this plan that we're, that we're, we're hearing and we're, we're seeing, but I need to see the actual steps forward. So. Um, I, I continue to, to support you know, your province and, and what's happening there, but not by building new pipeline infrastructure. Thank you. Questions and comments? Uh, the Honourable uh, Member for Kingston and the Islands. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Um, I listened to the member's uh, um, speech today, and I uh, congratulate her on her uh, main speech in the House. Uh, and my question uh, comes out of some of the comments that she made. She started off by talking about the uh, speech from the throne and that she uh, very much liked the words that were in it and, and what it had to offer, um, but then seems to be reluctant to support it based on the fact that um, of, of the fact of her interpretation of what happened over the past four years. Um, I, I'm curious if it's more important to be looking, and, and in, in the spirit of trying to work together, we should be trying to collaborate in a way that brings us uh, together and that we approach uh, uh, this from uh, a place of uh, trying to have some trust in each other to bring forward ideas and to present them to the House. Would she not agree at the very least, uh, given that and given what she said, that she does support the speech from the throne, uh, notwithstanding the fact that she might have reservations to voting for it based on her um, interpretation of what happened over the last four years. The Honourable Member for Fredericton. Thank you, Madam Speaker. That's an excellent question. Um, and I think that, you know, again, reading it, hearing it, I, w I was very excited. I thought, wow, this is, uh, this is the Canada that I want to be a part of. This is the government that I would like to support. Um, but it's just that it's holding the government accountable, and, and their actions over the last four years are certainly part of this process. I can't just take the word for it anymore. Um, my colleague from Sandwich Gulf Islands read some pieces from the 2015 throne from the speech, or speech from the throne. And I just, we, we can't be kind of duped into believing that this is the time. This is the time to believe. Um, so as much as I want to support, as much as I think this, this speech was, was great and well-intentioned, and I do believe that um, even steps forward on reconciliation, on climate change are, are, are well-intentioned, I think that they're still missing the mark. Um, and I, I need our government to start hitting that mark because time is of essence. Uh, I've got two little children who need a future that they can uh, you know, live in and, and breathe clean air and have clean water. Thank you very much. And comments, the Honourable Member for Cowichan, Malahad, Langford. 
think I... Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I, I can remember visiting Fredericton in 2016 when I substituted on the Special Committee on Electoral Reform, and it was really great to see the strong support from the residents in that town. And, and I know the member is as disappointed in that previous promise as I am. Um, I met some renewable energy uh, contractors who were specializing in tidal energy, and I'd just like the member to talk about uh, some of the energy projects that are going on in the Bay of Fundy. I remember those uh, operators telling me that the tides were so strong there that their first prototypes broke because the currents were so strong. So just wondering if she can talk a little bit more about those renewable energy projects. <clears throat> the Honourable Member for Fredericton, ten, five seconds. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you for your question. Um, so that, that turbine actually remains still at the bottom of the ocean on our coastline, so we weren't actually prepared with the technology to harness that amazing power that we have with Tidal. I would like to see our technology catch up. Um, there's also great opportunities for offshore wind, but we need our provinces and some regulations to change there as well. We need a willingness on, on the side of government to support some of these changes. Um, there's, there's so many exciting things that are just we're, are so possible and are ready to be deployed, um, but we continue to invest in old, outdated infrastructure that holds us back as Canadians. Thank you very much. <laughs>